The Twix Challenge has been incredibly successful in transforming mainstream fund managers to become gender smart and adopt the gender lens across the investment cycle. That's Jessica Espinoza, CEO of 2X Global. When you say specifically that language, gender smart investing, what do you mean? It's not only investing with a gender lens to have impact and promote gender equality, but also that it's smart because it makes economic sense and it's just a smart way of investing. I want to come back to this concept of mainstreaming, gender smart capital. What does successful mainstreaming look like? We intentionally decided to structure the Twix Challenge in such a way that investors are looking at their entire business to make gender smart deals. Where we see a lot of progress with mainstreaming gender across business as usual, but there are still challenges. Despite research showing that female founders outperform their male peers, startups with a solo female founder or an all-female founding team raised a mere 2% of all the funding in Africa last year. There is a huge gender funding gap. How do we close it? This episode is the last of our five-episode series on gender lens investing. Co-hosted by Eloho Omame, founding partner of First Check Africa, an early stage fund backing female-led startups. Each episode of this series will explore a different level of the fundraising value chain. In this episode, we're exploring ecosystem and capacity building with Jessica Espinoza, the CEO of 2X Global, an organization aimed at unlocking gender smart capital at scale. Jessica chairs the 2X Challenge that has raised more than $27 billion of gender lens investments since its launch at the G7 Summit in 2018. This series is created under the ScaleX Project, co-designing solutions to close the early stage gender financing gap in Africa, an initiative of Make IT in Africa. Make IT in Africa promotes entrepreneurship and innovation ecosystems across Africa for green and inclusive development. The program is implemented by the German development agency GIZ on behalf of the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. Before we start, we have one small favor to ask. If you enjoy the show and want to support the content that we create, please hit that subscribe button. It only takes a second, but it will mean a lot to us if you do. Our mission is to unlock gender smart capital at scale. And we have as of today over 150 member institutions across the spectrum of capital providers uh, across all global regions. The 2X Challenge is how everything started for us at the 2X initiative. The 2X Challenge was launched as a collective capital commitment at the G7 summit in 2018. And at the time it was really this unprecedented commitment by the development finance institutions to mobilize at least $3 billion of capital that benefits women. And we gave ourselves a time frame of three years, so from 2018 to 2020. This target was uh, significantly overachieved. What we thought was really ambitious actually turned out to be uh, quite achievable. And we ended the, this three-year period with over $11 billion um, collectively invested. As of today, we have raised over $27 billion under the 2X Challenge. And this year, we will launch a new challenge, which will have few exciting new features, but that really builds on the lessons and experience of the last five years. You talked just now about the 2X Challenge, Capital That Benefits Women. When you describe the work of your organization, you talk about unlocking gender smart capital at scale. So maybe we can sort of rewind a little bit, get an education around the concept of gender smart investing versus, for example, gender lens. Maybe those are the same thing. Maybe they're different things. But it'd be interesting to understand when you say specifically that language, gender smart investing, um, what do you all mean? We like both terms, but gender smart investing is uh, a term that we use a lot because it really speaks to the fact that it's not only the right thing to do. You know, it's, it's not only investing with a gender lens to have impact and promote gender equality, but it's also smart because we see that there are a lot of ripple effects, both on, on other impact topics or impact objectives, but also that it's smart because it makes economic sense. It makes a sense from a return perspective. And it's just a smart way of investing. What it means for us is when, when we started with the 2X challenge, there wasn't really a common standard or definition of what is meant by gender finance or by gender lens investing. And so we collaborated with others in the industry to develop the 2X criteria. We're today a global industry standard for gender finance. And that for us is kind of stands for what we mean by gender lens investing or gender smart investing. And the 2X criteria focus on opportunities along the full business value chains. The first criterion looks at entrepreneurship at companies founded and owned by women. The second one on leadership. So the share of women on board of directors, ICs uh, for funds and uh, among senior management. Then the third criterion looks at 
quality employment and the share of women in the workforce and workplace policies and practices that promote gender equality. And then finally, the fourth one looks at products and services and how they benefit women. There's a fifth one, which looks at investments through financial intermediaries like financial institutions and funds. And that fifth criterion says that we look at these institutions through the lens of the two criteria, both at the level of that institution as well as at their portfolio level. Your members or your network is, is institutions, right? Or are you investing directly in companies taking this dimension? Our members are institutions who are applying the 2x criteria to their investments. So we've seen a very wide adoption of the 2x criteria. If you're an LP, you can apply them to the funds that you invest in or the fund managers and their funds. If you're a fund manager, you can apply them to your portfolio companies. If you're an infrastructure investor, you can also use them. There's also additional guidance on how to apply them to infrastructure and project finance. So it's, it's really widely adoptable. And also our own members are uh, looking at themselves and conducting their own self-assessment on where they stand as an institution, also through the 2x criteria, which is quite exciting. Again, not to oversimplify, but it sounds as if the goal from an institutional perspective is having more and more institutions thinking in a very sort of framework-driven way about gender smart investing and applying it in very practical ways. So I would imagine there's an element of education, tools and resourcing around how you support them, capital perhaps. Maybe you can talk to us a bit about then sort of how you apply the 2X framework within your membership and how you sort of develop their sort of gender smart um, concepts. Happy to talk a bit more about how we're set up. So as I mentioned, our mission is to unlock gender smart capital at scale. And we have identified three strategy pillars to achieve that mission. The first one is to build investor capacity. So what we've learned under the 2X challenge is that it's really valuable to bring together investment practitioners around the table and to build their capacity because they are ultimately the engine of making the capital deployment ha happen, right? So it's really important for them to understand the why. Why is there such a strong case for investing with a gender lens? What's the business case and impact case in my particular sector or asset class or region? Uh, but then also to collaborate on the how. So how exactly do you do it in different contexts and, and different with different types of investments? And we've developed a lot of kind of master classes, trainings, peer learning opportunities, as well as uh, tools, so very practical tools that we co-developed with our investment practitioners to make it practical and to actually move the needle. Then the second strategic priority or our pillar is to advance standards. And that's where we started with the 2x criteria. And as you just pointed out, the idea from the outset was to have a common framework that's pretty simple so that it can be widely adopted and that we're all using the same definition, speaking the same language and having a common framework, even if we may be operating in quite different regions, uh, different sectors, different asset classes, and so on, so that they can really be adopted across global regions. And we are now in the process of launching a 2x certification mechanism, which will take that standard setting work to the next level. So the 2x certification mechanism builds on the 2x criteria. And so there is this, you know, kind of recognized simplicity as a starting point. But then it goes a lot broader and deeper into the different dimensions of the 2x criteria and also thematic areas. And our aim there is if we say the 2x criteria is what good looks like in gender smart investing, uh, then 2x certification also establishes the higher tiers of what is better or what we call advanced and what's best in class. So we really want to, to go broader and further and move the needle uh, further also in terms of depth of impact. And then our third strategy pillar is to shift markets. And that's where we have a few quite innovative initiatives. And the idea here is that we are ourselves starting to deploy capital in areas where we see that there's really a huge need and where we could unlock significant impact at scale, but where the market is currently not moving because of market failure. And there we have initiatives like 2x Ignite. Essentially, it's a market building facility to back this next generation of female fund managers with gender smart investing strategies that is currently significantly underfunded. And then we also recently won the mandate to manage the Climate Gender Equity Fund, 
which is a grants uh, vehicle that provides catalytic grants to innovative investment opportunities at the nexus of gender and climate. And that, again, here the idea is to crowd in others and crowd in significant private capital by providing, actually, you know, maybe that first check uh, to, uh, you know, to speak also to your, your mandate and mission, to write that first check and crowd in others to, to support. We've been thinking a lot about this chicken and egg question of how you solve some of these problems. And we're taking a value chain approach to the series. I think you use that term earlier because it seems true that there are interventions needed at various different levels. You also just talked about sort of market failures and in your work with the institutions in particular, I'm curious if you can speak a little bit more to, I guess, the set of considerations that they have and and why all of this capacity building and ecosystem development work is necessary to solve this problem, right? Especially if investing, you know, you talk about gender smart, right? Investing in women is, is a smart thing, can lead to good returns. There's plenty of data around all of that, but it feels like there's still a very heavy lift to solve this chicken and egg question for, um, you know, increasing more capital towards women. And I'm curious if you can talk about the cause and effect of that. Yeah, I think when we uh, when we started several years ago to talk a lot more about the opportunity of gender smart investing, there was a lot of curiosity, but it wasn't really clear what the opportunity really was. So even in 2018, when we launched the 2X Challenge, we got a lot of, you know, kind of skeptical comments. Uh, what do you mean investing in women? Is that now a CSR initiative? You know, is there really a market? A lot of misconceptions. And so it took quite, um, quite some effort, uh, you know, to really show the opportunity, the market, the business case, as well as the impact imperative. Um, but especially the impact case, which was interesting because even at the time, there was already so much evidence, you know, there were already all these McKinsey studies that showed the return on investment and very concrete, um, financial statistics and, and studies of why this makes business sense. But I, I guess it's, uh, for the investment investor community at the time, it was quite hard to apply that to their own context. You know, so everybody knows about these big, big figures, but what does it mean for me as an investor in my particular market with the different instruments that I have and, and the sectors that I operate in? In the early days, there was really this need for the translation work of what's the why, what's the case? But then also, what does it mean for you uh, in your particular, you know, company or fund or wherever you are? And how can how can you adopt the gender lens and and unlock your own business case and in, in your particular area? So that's where we had a lot of peer learning, where we developed case studies, uh, also co-invested together on actual deals to you know have kind of a demonstration effect and and a case. And that's also where the two X challenge really helped on the one hand because it was this community of practice where we co-invested and collaborated on deals. So it was, you know, kind of a lot of on the job or on the deal capacity building. But at the same time, it also allowed us to really demonstrate to investors globally how to do it, what it means, and and to present some very tangible case studies, as well as, you know, kind of tools. So in the early days, we were developing our own checklist for due diligence, and we're then sharing that with other investors to show how we're doing it. And then over time, it became, you know, much more sophisticated and and kind of bigger tools, but it started with this collaboration among practitioners in the early days. And I would say today, fast forward, there's a lot more understanding about the why and the how, but there are still challenges. And I, I think where we see a lot of progress is really with mainstreaming gender across business as usual, but there's much less progress with challenging business as usual and thinking about more fit for purpose capital, for example, or other instruments, more innovative finance. And so we're still seeing a lot of structural biases and barriers as well. That raises a few questions in my head. One is knowing that a lot of your members are DFIs who are already investing with an impact lens. Was it that the impact lens, I guess, wasn't, I don't know, inclusive or broad enough to see the outcomes that we desired from a, a gender lens perspective? And then maybe related to that, you know, I think you guys are trying to set an agenda as it relates to, to gender smart capital. And I think there's a question about like the downstream impact, right? So when we look at the value chain, it's if there are more DFIs who are directing more money to fund, more fund managers who can invest in more funds, right? I think there's a, there's a question for me about 
how far down does that measurement go, right? In terms of how and why these interventions, you know, were needed to actually uh, change the status quo. So uh, in the early days, we started uh, our membership with the DFIs. So we started initially with the G7 DFIs, then grew to 20 DFIs and uh, MDBs, multilateral development banks. And today with over 150 member institutions, the DFIs are actually like a smaller uh, portion of that. We have about 20 DFIs and over 150 members. So um, it's now much more diversified. But of course, the DFIs still have a lot of weight. They have the signaling, you know, signaling power and important actors in our network as well. And still in many, many cases, the leaders uh, in the space. So uh, when we started, I think it was, you know, in a way it was not DFI specific. I think it was what a lot of impact investors were facing that they thought by focusing on development or impact with a gender neutral, what was assumed, presumed to be a gender neutral approach, you, you would have a gender equitable approach, right? And, and if there are female entrepreneurs, they would have uh, an equal chance at getting funded. And only really when diving a lot deeper into portfolios and looking at the investment process as well of how decisions are made, you know, starting with very simple things like how do you source your pipeline? We started to realize that there were important gaps and that a gender blind approach wasn't good enough, but that we had to be really intentional if we wanted to make sure that there wasn't any gender bias and that female entrepreneurs or gender smart businesses um, across the two X criteria had a, an equal opportunity. And it was really then that we started to realize, you know, kind of see the business case and also the impact case and adopt a much more intentional strategy. And that's what we've since seen uh, with many other investors as well, that there is this recognition that by just being blind to gender, you're not, you know, it's, it's not happening um, by itself. Where the Twix challenge has been most successful, you know, kind of reflecting on your second question, I would say is really with this idea of mainstreaming gender across institutions, portfolios, the range of deals in diverse sectors. And the Twix challenge has really changed the DFI's way of doing business. And this has had important trickle down effects on fund managers and businesses. Reflecting on the lessons of the first years of the Twix challenge, we realized that the next frontier is to go beyond mainstreaming gender to more intentionality and more fit for purpose capital. If we take uh, the example of allocation to fund managers, the Twix challenge has been incredibly successful in transforming mainstream fund managers to become gender smart and adopt the gender lens across the investment cycle and build more gender smart portfolios. However, it has been a lot less successful in uh, allocating capital to this next generation of female fund managers who are raising innovative gender lens investment vehicles and are still facing significant barriers when fundraising. And that's mostly because one, they are perceived as first time fund managers and are therefore perceived as more risky. And two, the type of gender bias that is, you know, well documented at the level of female entrepreneurs is reinforced at the level of fund managers. And so we see lots of excitement about established male founded funds who diversify their leadership teams, bringing on board more women. But where there is still, you know, kind of much less traction and more gender bias is at the level of women founded funds and, and companies. And that's where we want to move the needle a lot more. Jessica, just I've got a, a comment which I'd, I'd love to, you to comment on. So it's interesting. It sounds as if you, as, we, as we're having these different conversations, a bunch of questions that we're trying to explore across the value chain. But one of them is really this question of, I guess, where is the highest leverage point for impact when you think about, you know, for example, the gender funding gap and how to potentially reduce it. And some people will take a multi, I suppose, I suppose a multidisciplinary approach whereby they talk about education and mentorship and as well as, as capital. Others will say, look, the primary issue here is one of bias and it's about investment processes, et cetera. In a couple of points now, you've sort of referenced bias, bias at the level of the funds themselves and the fund managers themselves and their sort of ability to raise capital and also bias in the investment processes, I guess, such that you have um, the frameworks that are designed to effectively eliminate those. Is it fair to say that your philosophy is, or your organization's philosophy, is that really the core issue and the primary issue that needs to be addressed is, is one of bias? Or do you sort of, again, think about things a little bit more multidisciplinary? 
I think it really depends. So I, I wouldn't say that it's across the board, you know, that the primary issue is bias. I think it depends. I think in some areas it's, you know, it, it's definitely more multifaceted. And in some areas it might be more a question of more capacity building, including among investors of the how, how to do it, how to incorporate a gender lens across the investment cycle. Um, it might also be um, other challenges, you know, including, for example, regulatory restrictions on more innovative financial products. So I think there are definitely multiple, you know, angles and leverage points. But when we look specifically at the fund management space and private equity and venture capital in particular, I think the key issue is, is often time bias. And it's, can, and it's different types of biases, right? I think there's in general a bias against first time fund managers, but if they are women, you know, that bias is further compounded. I think there's also often a bias against general lens investing, you know, kind of the example that I mentioned earlier, if an established private equity fund that was very mainstream before is now adopting a gender lens and using the TWIX criteria, there's a lot of excitement and they attract a lot of capital. But if a fund manager is raising a new fund or if a new team is coming together and they're raising a fund and they have a very intentional gender lens investing strategy, they might, you know, get questions like, oh, aren't you just looking at half the market? Because, you know, people assume that they are just looking at women and they would counter, no, actually we are looking at the full market. You know, the mainstream funds are ignoring 50% of the market. So I think how these funds are looked at is different. Another type of bias that we see is if even among first-time fund managers, if a man is raising a 50 million fund, you know, it's great. If it's a woman, she's asked why she's raising such a big fund and <laughs> if it wouldn't be better to start with 10 million. So I think, you know, it's different forms of bias. Sometimes it's more kind of in your face and sometimes I think it's more subtle. But in that particular space, I think it still has a lot to do with bias. The other area, maybe, you know, kind of that could also be seen as a form of bias, but it's less obvious and less intentional, perhaps, is just the types of instruments that are available. So, for example, if an institutional investor, right, an LP and funds is only able to write tickets of 20 million and they can't have more than, say, 20 percent of the fund, then they're unable to invest in smaller funds, for example. And and therefore can't, for example, invest perhaps in VC funds or in more early stage funds or innovative vehicles. You could say, you know, it has nothing to do with gender. It's just that <laughs> they, they have a different mandate. But of course, you could also go further and ask, well, where's that mandate coming from? And can they change the mandate? Uh, but that's a more complex issue, perhaps. My second question is around, I want to come back to this concept of, of, of mainstreaming gender smart capital. And you said that, you said a couple of times now that that's really where you've seen quite a lot of success in, in sort of the initial journey and it sort of informed your strategy going forward as well. Can you talk a little bit about when you say, number one, mainstreaming, what does successful mainstreaming look like? Perhaps there's some relationship, for example, to when you describe established funds then incorporating gender smart concepts, but having successfully or having had lots of su success in this area of mainstreaming in practice, what has that meant? Maybe I can, you know, use a few examples and kind of contrast it to, to what I mean with mainstreaming. So, for example, the 2x challenge, uh, at, at the time when we started it, we could have taken an approach to say we are raising a small fund, right? Or we have like a designated initiative. We are raising, for example, one billion for this very particular purpose with a gender lens. And it's ring fence. It's kind of, you know, a side initiative. And then there's business as usual. That would not be mainstreaming. That would be a very intentional approach and maybe, you know, even a really good approach, but it would leave business as usual untouched and it would be like a side initiative that, you know, would be celebrated. And, and we intentionally decided to structure the Twix challenge in such a way that investors keep the assets on their balance sheet. So they're all co-investing, uh, but they're all having it on their own balance sheet. And they are looking at their entire business for an opportunity to make gender smart deals. So what happened with that approach is that they use the TWIX criteria and they embedded them into all of their systems. So for example, a DFI, whether they do direct investments at private equity or if they do direct debt or if they invest in 
a fund or in an infrastructure project, whatever they do across all of their, their business, they look at those opportunities through the 2x criteria and the 2x criteria are fully integrated into all of their systems. Like that's a mainstreaming approach. With this example of a DFI, right? Not mainstreaming would be to say, let's have one technical assistance product that's all about gender. And then that's our gender thing, but let the other business units alone. Like that would not be mainstreaming. <laughs> and in a way, um, it's not to say that one is better than the other. I think there's also really a need, you know, to have gender first tools of capital and TA products that are innovative that have a gender lens, but it's very different from fully transforming an institution. And in a way, mainstreaming might be, you know, could be seen as easier because you take many different entry points and do it across your business, but it can also be more transformative because you're really changing the way of doing business across the organization. One theme that's emerging in this series is th there's a, it seems like a little bit of a tension around how to measure success. And maybe this gets into the 2X criteria as well. But, you know, I was looking at the 2X Challenge Insights Report, and there are people who are talking about, you know, we qualify deals under certain specific criteria, but we're not often thinking about a theory of change or it's sometimes too easy to qualify deals. And maybe inside of that tension also, there's this question about in the context of biases and, and venture and perceived risk for, for women and founders and things like that. This idea about traditional venture scale businesses versus SMEs, right? This idea about female founders versus gender diverse teams versus female focused businesses. And I'm curious to know how you and the organization think about that, um, because it does relate to this question that we want to get to next around how to measure success. And for me, you know, I, I think unlocking billions of dollars for gender smart initiatives is a goal unto itself, but it seems like that also might not necessarily be enough in the context of what you just said with, with mainstreaming. So how do you think about that? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. And perhaps starting with the latter part of your question about, you know, the, the big volume targets and, and unlocking significant amounts of capital. I think uh, these capital deployment goals, you know, are definitely important if we want to shift capital at scale. And that's also where we see most momentum, most excitement. But we also have to be conscious that big volume targets can backfire and the greatest challenges of our times. And especially if we look um, at, at opportunities on the African continent and what we are hearing from you know, entrepreneurs and from fund managers on the ground is that they require really fit for purpose capital. What you just um, alluded to, instead of just a conventional model that has perhaps worked well in developed markets, that we need more context specific solutions that are, you know, perhaps more SME finance or other innovative vehicles, perhaps um, revenue based finance or other models. And it also often means smaller tickets. And so by just having volume targets, there's a real disincentive to deploy capital where it's most needed. And unfortunately, we're also seeing this in the global debates around mobilization, especially in development finance, you know, where everybody's excited about mobilization. But if you have very high mobilization targets, it can actually mean that you're doing bigger investments, less risky, um, you know, that's more appealing to those who can mobilize. And so we have to be very conscious of the challenges that come with it. For me, it's, it's not an, you know, kind of either or. I think we need these volume targets still. And now people are, you know, excited to dream about the next uh, trillion and so on. And I think it's, a, it's great. Uh, but at the same time, we should also have other additional metrics you know, targets, for example, on, on the fit for purpose capital, or maybe also the number of deals, right? So that um, you also celebrate it if you make small tickets, because that's what's needed in many cases. Or if you take more risk, if you go more into early stage investments, and then also, how can we give more credit to those who really go the extra mile on impact and measurement, who have a theory of change, who are, you know, a lot more intentional about what change they want to affect and how impact is actually happening on the ground. And with that, um, I think it's also important to speak more about transparency and to give credit to those who are transparent in you know, all of their metrics, their investments, what's happening, so that we as a community can also learn and have that data available. And I can just make sure that as, as a field, we're moving forward and learning from each other. Can you say a little bit more about you know the impact and theory of 
change, I think, beyond just, again, this like volume metric. I think reading through the report, a lot of people were talking about wanting to be more intentional in capturing or generating or measuring impact. And that was quite interesting to me because, um, again, it says that you know, this idea about just unlocking billions of dollars for gender smart initiatives is perhaps not a, necessarily a goal unto itself in the context of maybe the broader goals of the development community. So what does that mean then in terms of the, you know, how, how to measure and how to implement here? The theory of change, I think it has to be tailored to the particular actor or, or the type of institution. So say, for example, if you're a fund manager, you have a, you know, you have an investment thesis, like what's that, what's the fund's uh, thesis? What is ultimately the, the change you want to affect? And then breaking it down into what are you doing? So perhaps how are you sourcing deals? You know, are you looking to source companies that are already gender smart and are having a positive impact? Or is, is it more that you're looking for companies that have the potential to become gender smart and then over the your holding period as part of the value creation you know plan that you develop that's kind of your strategy that's that's where you make the delta and create impact and then you have a responsible exit and you know you can see uh, the impact that you've made over over the time of your investment and then are you investing you know maybe in education or in agri in agriculture or What's the kind of sector and what's the change that you want to affect in that sector? And you can use the TWIX criteria as a starting point to think about the business value chain. Uh, but then you should also come up with additional impact metrics. And you can use, you know, for example, Iris Plus or other harmonized frameworks to think about those additional metrics. But what is it that you're putting in? What are your processes? And then what is it that, you, that you're measuring as, as outcome? So with uh, to x certification, we're looking at different opportunities along, you know, what could be considered a theory of change or what could inform a theory of change. So it's looking at the input, you know, do you have a certain policy? Do you have certain practices, management systems, uh, but then also um, performance indicators. So how are you actually performing on, on certain dimensions? And then also outcome metrics. And we're also looking at how do you approach impact management and measurement? So a much more holistic approach. And we hope that that will provide guidance and make it easier for, for all those who said, you know, they want to do more on depth of impact, being more intentional. With the next 2x challenge, we're also implementing some quite significant changes. First of all, we will be opening it up to the full spectrum of investors. So uh, as you know, in previous rounds, it was the DFIs who were able to qualify deals and other investors were coming in as co-investors. Co Going forward, uh, any 2x global member can fully participate in the 2x challenge and qualify deals. So that's already opening it up to a broader spectrum of capital providers. And then what, what we think is going to be particularly exciting is that we will have much more engagement around thematic priorities. So kind of this idea of gender and, so gender and climate uh, and clean energy, uh, care or Jedi, broader justice, equity, diversity and inclusion, so that we can really group our members around, you know, those pri priority areas where we want to see more capital going and then how can we all collaborate and also measure it and make it much more tangible for each episode of this series my co-host eloho amame and i sat down for a retrospective conversation to reflect on the insights shared by our episode guests in talking to jessica she talked about mainstreaming gender yeah and i know that that was something that you <laughs> took away i'm wondering what your perspectives are on what she had to say about mainstreaming gender I really liked it, this idea of really embedding gender consciousness into investment processes and things like that. And again, I suppose the reason that I think is, imp is important is back to this thing around you can't move what you don't measure, the diversity has a dividend, all of those things, which I think make economic sense. So I really like it. I also like the concept of mainstreaming. I think it resonates quite a lot with me because to a certain extent, that's also how we think about our portfolio support at First Check Africa is that I think if you look on our website, there's some language around helping female founders move into the mainstream. It's this idea that these silos are not beneficial in the long term. Cap tables where, yes, First Check Africa is there, but a mainstream VC fund, you know, we think of ourselves as pretty mainstream, but call it a non-gender focused VC fund is also alongside us, is a good thing. The crossing, you know, the next round, the seed round, that series A round, moving into 
global funds and mainstream funds is a good progression and a good path is something that resonates to me because it's the journey to making sure that our portfolio companies don't fall off this cliff, for example. It's the journey towards countering this effect around this kind of, if you have a female investor, then unfortunately the market views that as, 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 a, as a negative signal. The other reason that I think the conversation with Jessica, I found really interesting outside of the mainstreaming, which, which I love as an objective, and I haven't ever heard any other organization articulate a goal quite like that. But the other piece that I really liked was in really kind of this idea of giving the ecosystem language and frameworks with which to kind of harmonize concepts because the, and the 2x branding across everything was actually really yeah thought, really great it's like, really they, they great and really like powerful great, great marketers almost exactly you know? which and is maybe what the what it something like this initiative needs right is yeah because it can be very noisy and murky and confusing and and i say that as maybe somebody who contributes to the noise right with good intention as well but i think as an ecosystem, we don't all have to talk about the same thing, but when we are talking about the same thing, I think it should be clear what we're talking about. Yeah. And I think the approach that Jessica and her team have is really quite yeah. quite interesting. And my takeaway in particular was the role that an organization like 2X Global has in agenda setting mm -hmm. and in sort of getting everyone to push from the same direction, mm -hmm. right? And they are pushing from the same direction around broad consensus and being the convener that yeah gets perspective and takes mm -hmm. it in and decides like, this is what's important. Yeah. And then it seems like the, the outcomes are there, right? They've been able to get a lot of commitments to, 100%. you know, to these, which, yeah. you know. And if they've done it in a relatively short time yeah. as well. It's really, really, really powerful. And I wonder if you talked a little bit about like this flywheel effect as well. I know it's not necessarily the same, but there's a snowball effect also of mm -hmm. organizations or investors or LPs needing to see that other people are doing it too, right? And so they had a, a first round commitment mm -hmm. that I think was a, f a few billion dollars and they exceeded that goal. And then the second one was substantially mm. bigger. And mm. so hopefully that is the progress that we need to see from a directional trend perspective is that as more and more people do it, it's going to lead to more people allocating capital towards these initiatives as well. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. I also think, you know, same way we talk about it in the world of investing, I think you have to allow female founders or founders in general to build reps around companies right. and to make mistakes right. and to have another yeah. go at it. And you can't do that if, Number one, we're talking about lots of different things that are distracting. But aside from that, we're also just not giving them the capital to build yeah. the companies. And and actually, to some extent, what we're talking about in the context of gender lens investing is a similar conversation that the ecosystem has had in the African tech ecosystem mm -hmm. generally, right? Mm -hmm. About it's just um, a microcosm of that. It's yeah, the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and about the the degree to which impact investors need to measure and what is expected of founders inside of that. The degree to which African founders generally are are over mentored and underfunded, right? And the degree to which there is an acceptance of failure and the degree to which funds have a buffer built in where they can get more shots on goal and allow more failure. It's all the same. Mm -hmm.